of singers with the level of leadership that we have. I'm just constantly blown away with the people that God's gathering in this house. And that tells me he's up to something. Mm. To have that kind of anointing, that kind of talent, that kind of gifting, it's just absolutely incredible. And a part of that is being able to share this pulpit. Um, typically in a church plant, like the main guy, like me, would have to preach every week, but I have the luxury of throwing it to Jason, to guys like Antoine, and today, my brother Nick. Yeah. Woo! If I can just briefly introduce this guy, um, Nick, Natalia, their son Josh joined us last February. They've been so faithful. Um, they lead our outreach uh, ministry here at this church. Um, and Nick, um, he's a minister himself. He's the uh, assistant associate, associate, yeah. associate director of Greek ministry in the greater LA area. He runs the show. Um, and they're just an amazing, amazing couple. <laughs> uh, loves the Lord. The reason he's sharing is because I, over, I overheard his testimony just in passing. And I'm like, wait a second, what? 
God did that in your life, you got to share. So today, he'll be sharing his word, sh- uh, sharing God's word, sharing about his life. He's also an avid tennis player where he's barely Christian on the tennis court. So don't be surprised, <laughs> all right, if he's not nice on the tennis court. Uh, amazing guy. So give a hand to my brother, Nick. Awesome. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Uh, well, good morning, church. Hey, I'm so excited to be here with you today. And I love the season that we're in. I mean, you can just feel the Advent just flowing from this place, can't you? It's awesome. And uh, I'm excited to be sharing, I mean, as Dihan mentioned, I'll be sharing a little bit, a lot of my story today. And uh, I I love Advent season, because Advent, in in Latin, it literally means the coming or the arriving. And it's a season that we get to celebrate the anticipation of Jesus coming into the world. And for a lot of us, that can mean a lot of different things. But when Jesus showed up, everything changed. And so three weeks ago, we started a series called When Jesus Shows Up. And so my story is all about how when Jesus showed up, he completely redefined the way I think about hope. I believe he, he, he completely redefined the way all of us look and, and define and, and think about hope. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, I know when, when you think about hope, some things can probably come to your mind. You can probably already think of things that you've hoped for desperately in the past. You know, warriors go 25 and 0. Come on. You know, come on, let's go. I know, too soon. It's too soon for me, too. I don't know why I said that. And some of you can think of something that you want for in the future. I mean, we all relate to that. And, and one of my favorite theologians, he has this quote on the slide, and he says, you and I are unavoidably and irreducibly hope-based creatures. I love that term, hope-based creatures, because I believe that God designed us to have hope. He made it so that we could be hopeful people. It's a great thing. And he said that if we were to put our full hope in Jesus, that he, would, he promises that he would give us life and life abundantly. Now, I don't know about you, but when I reflect on my relationship and with Jesus, it's been this constant back and forth of, What does it mean to put your hope in Jesus? Such a weird concept. How do you do that? Why would I even want to put my hope in Jesus? Can I even trust Jesus if I put my hope in him? And and I hope that some of you have those questions today. But the main question I want to ask is what do you place your hope in? I believe that we're all going to place our hope in something. And what's that for you? Now, I know it's Advent, it's Sunday, we're at church. For some of us, the answer is, oh, Jesus, of course, right? But the reality is, it's not always that easy. And some of you that have gone through situations in your life, maybe your marriage is in trouble. Maybe you've grieved the loss of, of, of a loved one. Maybe you have addiction in your life that you're stuck in, or, or, or maybe you're in this relationship or something that that is completely broken and toxic, you can't get out of it. There's depression, there's anxiety, money's tight. There's things in your life where if you've gone through any of that, you might be able to relate to, yeah, it's not that easy. So what do you place your hope in? And what I I hope to do today is I want to share with you how when Jesus showed up, he changed the way that hope is brought to our lives and anything compared to anything in this world compared to a speck of the hope that God can bring to your life is completely futile. God is the only one that will bring life and life abundantly. And that's what I hope to share today through a little bit of my story and through uh, a, a woman in, in Scripture who I believe is in a little bit of a hopeless situation. So can I do that today? Can I be vulnerable with you guys today? Awesome. Uh, so we're gonna, if you would open up your Bibles, we're going to look at John 4, 4 through 15. And uh, we're going to be, as you're opening your Bible, we're going to be looking at, or you can follow along on the screen, we're going to be looking at the Samaritan woman that Jesus meets. And this is not just an ordinary Samaritan woman. This woman has gone through a lot of hardship in her life. We'll find out later in the text that this woman has had multiple husbands. So to her culture, she's labeled as an adulterous woman. And because of that, she's a complete reject to her society. No one wants anything to do with her in any way, shape, or form. And she's a complete outcast. It, yeah, my story relates to her. That's, that's good. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm going to go ahead and, and read this passage. And uh, It says in John 4, Jesus was on his way to a town called Galilee. And it says, now he had to go through Samaria. 
So he came to a town in Samaria called Sashar, near a plot of ground. Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well, a famous well, was there. And Jesus, tired from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Now, really quickly, here we see that Jesus is alone with the Samaritan woman. The disciples were gone. Uh, and you'll also notice the time of the day. It's noon. Of course they're alone. It's the hottest part of the day. I mean, we're talking about like desert heat here. It's scorching. It is unbearable. And this woman is by herself at the well. Well, most people, when they went to draw water from the well, they'd go late at night or they'd go early in the morning because they don't want to be in this crazy sweltering heat. But this woman is so rejected from her society, she has to go at noon to get water from this well every single day. And so she meets Jesus alone at this well. Verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews did not associate with Samaritans. So really quickly, Jewish people believe that they, if they associated with Samaritans in any way, they become unclean. They become infected. In fact, they have completely avoided being in Samaria. If, they, if a single part of their body touched it, they'd be infected, right? That's the tension between Samaritans and between Jewish people. So imagine really quickly, imagine you're this woman, and every day you get up, you tiptoe around your town, the whole town labels you as an adulterous person, so you kind of just scurry on out, it's super hot, you're, you're doing this every single day, and you get to the swell, add insult to injury, great, now there's a Jewish guy at the well, and now he's talking to me. Okay, this is, this is like the worst day for me. So verse 10, Jesus answered, they get in this dialogue, and Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Let me translate this really quickly. What she's actually saying is, dude, it's hot. You're Jewish. I'm a Samaritan. Why are you talking to me? This is really weird. Living water? What are you? You got nothing to draw, draw water with. Like, this is such a weird concept. Are you greater than our father? J like, literally, uh, that, what she says in verse 12 is like a Samaritan pass at Jewish people. I don't have time to get into that, but that's the posture of this conversation. But what's really interesting is Jesus says something in verse 13 that kind of shakes this conversation. He says this, Jesus answered her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back here to draw water. Jesus said the one thing that I believe could have gotten the attention of this woman, and that thing was that her life, her daily routine of going out to the well every single day, her life could look different. When Jesus shows up, the hope of new life exists. Growing up, I would classify myself as an atheist. I grew up in, in a family of five. I was the youngest. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And, you know, you might know this person in your life, but I was that guy growing up. I was always in a relationship. You know, there's rarely a time from sixth grade, probably till I graduated college, I was always in a relationship. You know, and I was a guy that idolized relationships, and then eventually I idolized the person I was dating. You know, not a good combination. And uh, you can probably tell that that led to a lot of broken, unhealthy relationships, led me to do a lot of silly things. For instance, the whole reason I went to the college I went to, the only school I applied to, was because of a relationship. And I don't recommend that to anybody. Don't do that. That's just not a good idea. Uh, and I, I had no intention of going to college, so I had to start really busting my butt to go to school. I applied to San Diego State. I got denied, fought harder. I'm going to get there. And then I applied on appeal, and I got in. And I was like, yes, I'm on my way to San Diego to go to the school. I told my dad they have a great business program. I have no idea. My dad's here. I'm sorry. I love you. And, but I wanted to go just so I could be with that girl. I, did, I wanted to do whatever it would take. And I was finally going. And in the very first week that I moved to San Diego, she cheated on me. 
and my hopes and dreams of this relationship working just fell apart completely. In the beginning of the semester, it spiraled me into this crazy depression. You know, San Diego State, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, people are out partying, and I'm in the dorms alone crying. I'm just absolutely miserable. You know, I remember I would call my, one of my best friends to this day, his name's Hondo, I used to call him because in this time, uh, as, as, a, as a semester went on, the pain got worse, and then suicidal thoughts started, you know, feeding into my mind. I would call my buddy Hondo, and every single time I saw a tall building, which didn't help that I lived in a dorm, every single time I walked by a tall building, dude, Hondo, I just want to die. I just want to jump off that building, man. It would feel so good. Don't worry, I won't do it, but I really want to. I really want to end my life. And I would have conversations with him like this all the time. I feel bad for him. I got to handle that. I, I would have conversations like that all the time. And as the semester went on, it just got worse. And I remember about halfway through the semester, I had spent so much time tormenting my thoughts of wanting to end my life. About two or three o'clock in the morning one day, I decided, it's over. I'm done. I'm going to end my life. And so I got up. I ran out of my dorm room. I sprinted down the hallway. I ran up the stairwell. And I got to the top of the stairwell where I believed that I could fulfill that fantasy of getting on the roof, staring down the edge, and just jumping off and ending my life. It would be so good. Please. That's what I want. And the only thing that got in the way of that fantasy becoming a reality was this chain and padlock that was blocked. I don't even know if that went to the roof, but I, I just believed it. And I, I'd, I'd pry on it. I'd say, please, please, just let me go. And I couldn't, I mean, I'm not Superman. I couldn't break it. I ended up going back to my dorm room. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but I was in so much agonizing pain that literally I was in front of my door. I just laid on the floor of the hallway because I was in so much pain. And I immediately called a suicide hotline. And the rest of the semester for me was talking to a suicide hotline, going to counseling, ODing on NyQuil just so I could go to sleep. That was the rest of my semester. Fast forward to the very end, I had another episode where I just wanted to end my life. And this time, for, some, for whatever reason, me, atheist guy, decided to go to these two Christian girls that I knew to say goodbye, and they asked me to pray and accept Jesus. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, that's what you say to me, right? Really? <laughs> but you know what? I mean, honestly, I, I was like, whatever. I got nothing to lose. <laughs> like, what do I do? And then they led me through this prayer, and I prayed it faithlessly. I was like, dude, whatever you are, sure, why not? Come to my heart. Yeah, what? <laughs> but the crazy thing is, when I said amen to that prayer, I kid you not, God pumped my heart with joy that I've never experienced in my entire life. I went into that room wanting to end my life, and God spiritually awakened me from the dead. <clears throat> but what's crazy, what's crazy about this is that was kind of just a glimpse of what God wanted to give me. He was saying, Nick, this is what your life could look like. You don't have to be stuck in this. I was stuck in a life of suicide, of depression, of self-mutilation. The Samaritan woman, she was stuck in a life of shame, of guilt, of condemnation. We both had no hope in sight of anything changes. But when Jesus showed up, the hope of new life existed. He showed me what that could be. When we're stuck in cycles of pain, of anxiety, of depression... God wants to come into your life and he wants to say, my son, my daughter, I have so much more for you. I have so much more. He did that for me and he did that for the Samaritan woman. So let's go back to the Samaritan woman. So then, so, G, so the Samaritan woman says, dude, where can I get this living water? That sounds awesome. And check out Jesus' response. In verse 16, he says, go call your husband and come back. I asked for water. I, you, what? I, anyway, so 17, it says, I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands, and the man in your life, right, and, and, and the one you're with right now is not your husband. What you said is quite true. So Jesus offers this living water, gets the woman really excited about it. She asks, where can I get this living water? And then Jesus brings up the very topic 
that roots up this deep shame in her life. It's the, very, it's, the, it's the thing that exiled her from her community. It's the reason she's at this well at noon, at the hottest part of the day, by herself. Jesus, it's a little insensitive, right? I mean, what? why? Why would you say that? Well, here's something that we have to understand about Jesus. Jesus has deep, compassionate love for those that are ostracized, marginalized, and rejected. The entire gospel is Jesus being with these people. He wanted to restore a broken people, to restore broken cities through himself, the gospel, through his life. And the gospel is beautiful. That's what you see. In fact, the people that really tick Jesus off, those are the religiously pious people. Go read Matthew 23. You'll see what I'm talking about. But that's, Jesus has deep love and compassion for those people. So if that's true, what is the purpose of why Jesus is bringing up this topic to this woman? When Jesus shows up, he reveals what blocks us from receiving living water. So after making the decision to follow Jesus, that freshman after God gave me that cool experience, I was like, cool, God, thanks. I'll see you later. I'm going to go this way. And I, I, the, the thing that I thought was best for my faith next was to join a fraternity, which, uh, you know, wasn't. I'll say that. And, uh, but, but you know what? I, I had this semester in college where I was cheated on, dude. I want my college experience back. And when I look at these Greek students, they party it up. This hookup culture, relationships, friends. I want that. Come on. So I joined a fraternity. And then for the next two and a half years, I throw myself hard into the scene. And I got the recognition that I wanted. You know, my new members, they were kind of terrified of me because I was the guy that led all the hazing. I'm sorry, Sigep. I know this recorded. I changed my ways. Uh, <laughs> and then I felt like I had all the respect from, my, from the older guys because, you know, I was... I was good at it. I was good at whatever I did. Thursday, Friday night was unlimited opportunity to do, to do whatever I wanted. And before I knew it, maybe like the Samaritan woman, I found myself in another relationship that was the exact same as, as the San Diego one. You'd think that I would learn the first time. I didn't. What ended up happening is I took this job in Sacramento to be with that girl. I uprooted myself from San Diego to be with her. And then within the first week, she cheated on me too. And at that time, I, I lived with one of my, I lived with one of my, yeah, horrible, right? <laughs> Learned the first time. I, uh, I moved into an apartment with one of my sisters, and, you know, that same night that I found out, we had this horrible, me and that girl, we had that horrible altercation. My heart was torn out after having my heart stomped on. I came back to the apartment, cried for a couple hours, then I get a pounding on the door. It's my sister's ex-boyfriend, and he says, get the F out, get the F out of my apartment. Me and your sister, we're done. I want you out tonight. Really? <laughs> really? So there I was in, in Sacramento, not San Diego. There I was in Sacramento with my heart completely torn to shreds with a full-time job where I just stared at a commuter, computer monitor all day. And slowly but surely, the things that happened in San Diego started happening in Sacramento. The thoughts of suicide started to come back. I say, no, 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 I worked through that. No, no, it's okay. But it came back so strongly, it got to the point where I had the plan, I had the time, I had the day. I researched the weapon of choice. And then one day, I was at AT&T, where I interned, I started researching different things, and it said, those that are at the highest risk of committing suicide have a plan. And then I realized, crap, I'm here again. The last place that I want to be. Some of you might be able to relate to being in a hopeless situation. I, I pray that it's not to that extent because that is not fun. But some of you might know what that's like. Pastor Dehan gave a message and he used this illustration of a cup filled with dirt. And if his daughter ever asked him for some milk, he wouldn't pour the milk in the dirt and be like, hey, drink up. But he'd clean out the dirt. He'd clean out the dirt, he'd clean out the cup so good milk could come that he could give to his daughter. When Jesus comes... He wants to reveal the dirt that's in our life because when we choose living water in different places that isn't God, what we're actually doing is adding more layers of dirt into our cup. And if you were to look at my cup, there are layers of filth, oil, grime, this buildup that had just been growing and growing. 
And the Samaritan woman, her cup was dirty because she was just seeking after intimacy, marriage after marriage, man after man. Can this relationship bring hope to my life? That's the same with me. And then a lot more. But God wants to reveal what that dirt is in your life. So what happens when he does that? Let's finish, let's finish the, the passage that we have in Scripture. And it says in John 4, 25, The Samaritan woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one, who, one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus' disciples returned, verse 28. Then leaving the water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And verse 39 says, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. When Jesus shows up, streams of living water will flow. The Samaritan woman comes to the startling, astonishing realization that the guy she's talking to is Jesus. Yeah, that Messiah that prophesied that he's going to give you living water, yeah, that was Jesus. That was him. But what's crazy is in that moment, she decided to live into the hope and the faith and the belief that who she spoke to was Jesus. And in that moment, it changed her life so much so that she left her water jar at the well. The very thing that she came for, the very thing that resembled her survival, going out every single day at noon to get this thing to help her live, the thing that resembled her being separated from her town every single day, the thing that resembled her shame, she left it at the well. Not only did she leave it at the well, but she went back to the town. You know that town that exiled her and condemned her for her sin? She went back to them and said, come see a man that told me everything I ever did. And let me tell you right now, only somebody who's tasted Jesus' living water can do something like that. Jesus wanted to restore her dignity. He gave her new freedom, new hope, new joy. He wasn't in the business of just changing a circumstance. He wasn't just like, oh, those people, they bring you shame. I'll kill them. You don't have to worry about it. No shame in your life. You don't have to deal. No, he changed her from the inside out that a well of life would spring and bubble inside of her. That is some high quality H2O. I would love me some of that. I'm preaching to myself right now. I would love that. Now, going back to uh, my testimony, I found myself in the same place I was. And God basically said to me, Nick, you can keep choosing living water in your fraternity. You can keep going to these places. But if you really want living water, you got to come to me. You got to come to me. And that's when I made this recommitment to Jesus. Okay. Okay. Fill my heart with joy like you did when I was a freshman. And he did it. My circumstances didn't change. I still wanted to kill myself. The girl I was dating was in a new relationship one week later. I, I, God provided me a new place to live, but other than that, everything was the same. And I knew that if I wanted living water, I had to fight for it. It was, it was time for me to roll up my sleeves, get dirty, go to my cup, and start emptying out the dirt that got in the way of me receiving this living water. It meant that I had to turn every single thought, every single thing that came to my mind, I had to turn it to God. Everything I wanted to do, I said, I had to turn it to God. When I had thoughts that I sucked, that I was ugly, that you're a loser, go kill yourself. I, I, even no matter how hard it was to believe, I said, no, God said that he loves me perfectly and I'm not going to believe that. No, I will not believe that. When God, when I wanted someone to cling on to, when I wanted intimacy in my life, I literally clung on to my Bible and clung on to prayer. I loved so many nights in that summer, I ended praying and I fell asleep praying. I'd be like, God, I love her. you know, and the same thing would be with reading the Bible. I just, I, I clung on as hard as I could to, to the Bible and to prayer. When, whenever thoughts of suicide would come to my mind, end your life, you're a pathetic loser, you suck, go, go jump off a building. No, I will not. In Jesus' name, I command this thought to leave. And I prayed in Jesus' name for those thoughts to leave. One more time, every single time it would come up, 
I did whatever I could whenever I was tempted to go to somebody for comfort, to call up a girl, a guy, whatever. I said, no, Lord, you are my comfort. Whenever I was tempted to look at pornography, no, Lord, you have more for me than settling for this. I'm not going to do that. And I had to fight and scrape to get this filth out of my life. My circumstances didn't change. But I'll tell you what, every single time I went to God instead of other things, living water started to come out. Did you know, did you know that God wants to bring living water to your life? God wants to bring living water to your life right now. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. Now, you could be here today, and you could be in a couple of different places some of you, it's like, what the heck? I've never, I've never even talked about Jesus before. Living water? This is crazy. Some of you may be able to relate to the things that I'm talking about, the hope of situation or whatever it may be. And I think the question I want to ask you, if you've never had a chance to enter into a relationship with Jesus, if you've never had a, a concept of doing that before, a question I want you to think about as the worship team plays this next song is, do you want to leave your jar at the well and bring your hope to Jesus? That's a question I want you to think about because after the song, I'm going to invite us into a time to respond to Jesus. And then for some of you here, you, you may relate to the Samaritan woman. You may relate to even some of my story where it's like you know the dirt. You know exactly what it is that God may be inviting you to get rid of, but it's hard. You might not want to. It's something that you, you, you've clung on to and confided in for so long. You know what it takes to get living water, but it's hard to actually give that up. What I want to ask you is, are you willing to get your hands dirty? Are you willing to get that dirt out of your life? Because Jesus wants living water to flow in your life. So I'm, I'm going to invite the worship team to sing this song for us. And I'm going to come up in a little bit and lead us into a little bit of response. This alabaster jar is all I have of worth. I break it at your feet, Lord. It's less than you deserve. Far more beautiful, more precious than the oil. Some of my desires and the fullness of my joy.
streams of living water will flow. And I just, let's enter a prayer, a posture of prayer as I lead us into some response right now. Just go ahead and bow your heads and pray. I ask a question to some of you. Do you want to leave your water jar at the well and put your hope in Jesus? You know, Jesus, the reason I love Advent is because Jesus came into the world. He left heaven to be with us, to live a perfect life, so that whatever you're going through in your life, He could die for it and overcome it when He, raised, when he was raised to life. After He died, He conquered death. That's the kind of God that, that we follow. And He wants you. He's calling for you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. He's knocking at the door, and He wants for some of you to answer Him. He's saying, I want to bring hope and life into you. My son, my daughter, come to me. And I will give you life more abundantly than ever you would ever know. If you've never had a chance to do that before, what I want to invite you to do is I want to invite you to stand up. And the reason I want to invite you to stand up is because when we say to Jesus that we want you to come into our lives, it's not just something that we think about. It's a whole life decision. It's something we do physically. It's something that resembles, God, I want to give you everything that I have. I want what the Samaritan woman had. I want this new water. I want this new life. I don't want to go at it the way I've been going at it anymore. I'm hopeless in this marriage. I'm hopeless in this relationship. I'm addicted to this. I'm addicted to that. God, I need you. And if you want that today, I want you to stand up so you can have a relationship with Jesus right now. I want to invite you to stand up to accept Jesus into your life. And I know for some of you that sounds like a risk. If you have ever felt like there's more, there, I know there's more to my life. I know there is. That's God saying to you, God, yeah, there is because I'm here and I want to give that to you. That's God saying to you, come to me. Come to me and I will give you living water. So if you want that, I want to invite you one more time. Stand up. Receive Jesus as living water. Pray with me, Lord, we thank you for your living water. We thank you, God, for this high quality H2O. Give us more, Lord. Give us more of that in our lives. We want to surrender to you, God. We want to surrender our lives to you. I believe that there's another group of people here today where you know that there might be some dirt. You know that there might be some filth in your life that God wants to get rid of. You know that. God has called it out. He's identified it. And the question for you is, do you want to make a recommitment right now? Maybe you've lived your life apart from God. You've said, no, I'm not going to get rid of this dirt. And it hasn't worked out. And God is saying, come back to me. Your life doesn't have to be perfect at all to do that. I don't care. Just say yes to me. And you and I together, we'll get rid of this stuff. We'll get rid of that dirt. And I will fill your life with living water. Some of you today can identify with that. Maybe you need to recommit your life to Jesus. Maybe you made a decision to follow Jesus before, but you need to make a recommitment to Him today and say, I need to turn back to you, God. I need to turn back. So if that's you, I want to invite you to stand up. If you feel like there's something in your life that you want to re-give your life to, something in your life that's holding you back from receiving all the Lord has to offer from you, I want you to stand up and recommit your life to Jesus today so the community will come around you and pray for you and be there with you in those hard times to get out that dirt. God wants to be with you. Thank you for standing. If that's you, I want to invite you to stand up one last time. Well, for those that are standing around this individual over here, can we put hands over you? We want to pray for you. God, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this decision. We thank you, Jesus, for that. We pray, Lord, that in this decision right now, in this recommitment decision, you would begin to pump living water in, the, in this woman's life, God, that you would reveal what she would need to do, God, to seek you when temptation comes, to seek you when things in the world are no longer working, God. We want you. She wants you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the ways that you answer prayer as we seek. Pray those things in Jesus' name.